I haven't been out of the house in over three years. You're not a magician and you are not God. One of my biggest regrets that I let my weight get so out of hand. You're not finna this mistake. I've been nothing but nice to your ass. Let's go. Every morning, Joyce wakes up, probably wondering why the universe is playing this cruel joke on her. She's bedridden, gasping for air like a fish out of water, and entirely dependent on her caregiver. Now, that's a wake-up call no one wants to answer. Hello, everyone. Before we start today's wild ride of the grossest moments on my 600-pound life that will shock you, smash that subscribe button and hit the bell so you never miss out on these jaw-dropping stories. Ready? Let's get to it. So I question why God even wakes me up. Just to go through another day like this. I'm just a prisoner here doing nothing because of how big I've gotten. And my weight makes it so hard for me to breathe. I have to use oxygen a lot of times just to get the air my body needs. Joyce's life is a battle on multiple fronts. Her size is just one enemy, the other is a monstrous lymphedema on her lower body. This grotesque growth is like a ball and chain, keeping her imprisoned in her room. Mobility? Ha! That's a distant dream. She's confined to her bed and a portable potty chair, the very symbol of her limited existence. And let's not forget the sheer humiliation of having someone else clean you up. Dawn, her caregiver, deserves a medal for dealing with this mess day in and day out. Morning. Morning. You ready to get up? I am. Dawn lives with me and takes care of me. And without her, things would be even worse. Because I can't even get out of bed on my own. That's how bad off my body is now. And then once I'm up, I'm barely even able to go a few feet at one time. Now, Joyce's personal care routine is something straight out of a horror movie. Bathing isn't a luxury, it's a Herculean task. Dawn starts by washing under Joyce's stomach right on the bed. Yes, you heard that right. Then, a hairdryer comes into play to avoid moisture buildup, followed by zinc oxide cream to fend off infections. Once the front is done, Joyce shuffles to her potty chair for the backwash and finally moves to the recliner for the upper body. It's like an Olympic event, except there are no medals, just exhaustion and a fleeting sense of cleanliness. We wash the lower part of my stomach and underneath it in my bed. But once she's done, okay, she has to use a hair dryer to dry those areas. Because if any moisture gets caught under a fold, it'll get trapped there and mold causes sores that will get infected. But Dawn also has to rub a zinc oxide cream on me to help prevent sores. Because without it, the natural chafing I have under my folds can start to break the skin over time. If you think hygiene is the end of it, think again. Next up is the gastronomical nightmare. Joyce's meals could feed a small army. After her grueling bath, she dives into food like it's her last meal. But who can blame her? Food is her escape, her slice of heaven in a hellish existence. Every bite is a moment of relief from her crushing reality. How did she get here? Well, food has been her twisted companion since childhood. That first bite is the best moment of my day. When I'm eating, I think nothing. That's what the best part of it is. Is when I'm sitting there eating, I have no worries about anything. I'm just thinking about how good the food is. And that's my life. I'll sit there in my recliner for the rest of the day and Don will bring me food and I'll eat it until it's time to go back to bed. I basically just live to eat now and I never leave this room. Joyce's love affair with food started young. Her parents split when she was three and her mother decided to play house with a new partner, sending Joyce off to grandma's. Abandoned and emotionally wrecked, Joyce found solace in eating. Grandma, perhaps out of guilt or sheer love, indulged her every whim. By the time she was eight, Joyce was tipping the scales at 100 pounds. Fast forward through more family drama and upheavals, and food remained the one constant. The one thing she could control. Or so she thought. But things changed when I was seven, because that's when my mom started dating someone who would become my stepdad. He had three sons and a daughter. But when they decided to get married, my mom moved in with them, 
but sent me to live with my grandma. I felt abandoned by my mom, like she didn't want me anymore. So I was upset and really hurt by that, but I did love being with my grandmother because she gave me constant attention and was always feeding me and making sure I had what I needed. And I think that's when my love for food probably started. But she fed me so much that I put on around 40 to 50 pounds while I was with her. Desperate to claw back some balance in life, Joyce turned to DR. Now, the weight loss wizard of the show. At a staggering 758 pounds, she needed a miracle. Doctor now admitted her to the hospital, slapped her on a strict 1,200 calorie diet, and threw in some physical therapy for good measure. The goal? Lose 150 pounds to qualify for surgery. Simple, right? Well, not quite. Let me check your stomach while you're here. So this is, uh, do you have any stomach pain or discomfort? No. Uh, can you raise your head up for me? Like I mentioned, you may have some hernia in here. And you do have a hernia and belly button. And so we'll have to fix that at some point. He laid it all out. Lose weight or lose your life. No pressure, Joyce. Her first progress report wasn't exactly a gold star moment. She dropped about 60 pounds, which in Dr. Now's world was underwhelming. He didn't hide his disappointment. Joyce, battling her demons, promised to try harder. The second visit wasn't any better. Her weight loss had stalled and Dr. Now's patience was wearing thin. He drilled into her the urgency, but the results didn't follow. Uh, we have we lose a lot, but not that much. We, we just wait till we catch your breath, and then I will be zero it, and we can get the correct weight. I'd prefer to just skip it. On the way back, I almost wasn't able to make my way back. All right, we'll try again later, but at least you got a little exercise today. But this poor level of activity is not good. So you realize that your functional capacity is very, very low and you're in a very dangerous situation. And by the third visit, clear, Joyce wasn't hitting the mark. Dr. Now reiterated the stakes, but despite her efforts, she just couldn't shed enough weight. No surgery for Joyce, at least not yet. By the end of her episode, she had lost 134 pounds. A significant drop, sure, but not enough for the life-changing surgery. Joyce's story is a grim reminder of relentless struggle against obesity. There's just no way. It just doesn't make sense. But I know now the scale is definitely messed up. So I'm really upset because once again, I'm figuring Dr. Now isn't gonna believe me when I tell him that the scale has to be wrong. Imagine starting your day with a massive, greasy breakfast, ordered before you even brush your teeth. For James Bedard, a 35-year-old New Yorker, this wasn't just a habit, it was a lifestyle. Every morning, James would begin his day with an unhealthy feast, treating food like it was the Super Bowl. Let's dive into how his story unraveled. Uh, can I get the original French toast? The amount of stuff that you could get is just crazy, so I just, I get excited. It's like the Super Bowl. You can get whatever you want now, you understand? And a slice of, uh, let me get a slice of ham. Two of them. Okay, is that all? Yes. But once I place an order, I get anxious, even though the food don't take long. James had a serious addiction to food. It was his escape from life's challenges, especially his battle with weight. Just taking a shower was an ordeal for him. Picture this, struggling to get into the bathtub, let alone making sure every part of him was clean. But how did James end up gaining so much weight in the first place? Bathing myself is the worst struggle of my day. Because moving around when you massage is very difficult and it could be very painful. Being obese is one of the worst conditions that you could be in in your life. From a young age, James was a foodie in the worst way. With his dad frequently away for work, his mom showered him with love through endless snacks and meals. By the age of six, James weighed over 100 pounds. His school days were a mess of food schemes and snack sneaking. He was the kid who'd fake bathroom breaks just to raid the cafeteria for extra snacks. Sounds insane, right? But when does this cycle ever break? That's my workout. After that's done, 
I'm ready for lunch. I grew up around food. It's always been a center point of my life. Coming up in the Caribbean culture, the foods that we used to eat is grill, uh, tasso, bonan pese, fritai. These are the names that we call them in Creole. You had your, like, it's collard greens, but they call it legume. As he got older, James's love for food only intensified. When his brother went grocery shopping, the list read like a party planner's dream. Ice cream, soda, chips, ribs, steaks, you name it. And when that food hit the kitchen, it was game on for James. But amidst all the indulgence, did he ever think of a healthier path? So I got cool with the lunch ladies in the cafeteria. I would sweet talk them, so they'll sneak me some food in the morning. I would lie to the teacher and tell the teacher I'm going to the bathroom, and I'll be end up in the lunchroom multiple times all day. And then I have a heavy meal at night, so it's just basically eating all day. So with all that constant eating, my weight got higher at a very quick pace. When I was eight, I was 300 pounds already. Desperate for change, James reached out to Dr. Now, the man known for turning lives around on my 600 LB life. During his first visit, James tipped the scales at a whopping 625 pounds. Dr. Now didn't mince words. He laid down the law with a strict 1200 calorie diet and a ban on sugary snacks and alcohol. The viewers were left biting their nails, wondering if James could stick to this drastic new regimen. You start doing twice a day, okay? Okay. And if you follow that, you should very easily be able to lose at least 80 pounds over the next two months. In two months? So, yeah. Okay? That's going to be easy goal to do if you stick with the 1200 calorie diet. All right. Okay? Yeah. That's the goal I'm going to give you. And if you do that, we're going to go ahead and ask you to move down Houston to get you in our program. Moving on to James's second visit. You'd think the prospect of death would be enough to change anyone's ways, but old habits die hard. James had only managed to shed 30 pounds. Not enough for surgery approval. Dr. Now, though frustrated, didn't throw in the towel. He tweaked the diet plan and sent James off with a stern warning, no more playing around. By the episode's end, James had only lost 119 pounds. All right, you all doing okay? Yes, we are. Good. Well, James, it looks like you're doing great. You lost 37 pounds, so you got some momentum going now. Yes, sir. So in total, you lost 119 pounds, which is a good start, but it's good that you are picking up the pace now. Yes, sir, I'm picking up the pace and I'm starting to see a difference. And other people are too, you know? My family, everybody, my support system say I'm doing a great job. So that's been encouraging. All right, folks, if you're enjoying the episode so far, give it a thumbs up and leave your thoughts in the comments below. Grab your popcorn and maybe a barf bag because we're diving into the wild, gross, and absolutely jaw-dropping of Ashley Taylor. Ashley Taylor's is the roller coaster ride you never asked for but can't look away from. This saga has everything food addiction, heartbreaking moments, and enough EW scenes to keep you watching through your fingers. Imagine a little girl with a food addiction that could rival a competitive eater. By age seven, Ashley was already tipping the scales at 200 pounds. Fast forward to 14, and she'd nearly doubled that. It's a gut-punching reality that's hard to digest, pun intended. We were going out to fast food restaurants around town. And those are the best memories of me and my mom. It had doubled my weight to 200 by the time I was seven. So I got really big and everyone took notice of that. And I tried my best to lose the weight, but it's just food is like my only friend. Food is my only outlet. Like food comforted me. And things in my life kept going wrong right after that. First, when I found out who my father was, because we had this family friend. Life didn't throw Ashley a bone, ever. She endured brutal bullying and some seriously messed up experiences. Imagine going through a horrifying ordeal with a neighbor and then losing your grandma. It's like a tragic soap opera, but real. You'd think life would give her a break, but nope. It's almost like the universe was using her life as a punching bag. My dad, like, it hurt me. And I used food to carry me through that. But it was like one thing after the next went wrong at that time. Because shortly after that was when one of my neighbors hurt me. He lived in the apartment across from us. And his wife would always say, come over and get cookies. And so one day I went over to get a cookie and I didn't know she wasn't home. Now, let's talk about her mom, 
the supposed pillar of strength. You know, every hero has a sidekick, but even Batman had better luck with Robin. When Ashley ended up in an epilepsy institution, feeling lonelier than a single sock in the dryer, it was like the trauma train just kept on chugging. Food became her best friend, reliable, comforting, and always there when people weren't. Honestly, who wouldn't turn to something dependable in such a mess? I mean, I turned to chocolate after a bad day at work, and that's nothing compared to Ashley's saga. Then my mom needed long-term care. She had to go immediately to a nursing home. So that's where she's been the last 10 years. My mom never got to come home. But when I found out, okay, she's not coming home, it took a toll on me, like I wanted to die. So I turned to food, my mom's gone, my dad don't give a f about me, let me just eat. But over the next year, the loneliness made me deteriorate. So that's when I started my second addiction. Ashley decided to seek help from DR, now Zaradin, our favorite no-nonsense weight loss guru. But here's where it gets rocky. Ashley's commitment to the diet plan? Let's just say she was more into performing the motions than making real progress. It was like watching someone say they're running a marathon, but taking a nap at mile one. The disparity between her plans and actions was like night and day. Had your issues or substance use problems? Not to my knowledge, I do not, because I'm not close with my family. And what prompted that decision? It's just, I've done some stuff, they've done some stuff. I've done more than them, but... So you're acknowledging that you've done some things? <laughs> I've done some stuff to hurt them. I'm no angel. So now you have me curious. Then came the moment of truth. Drum roll, please. She lost two pounds. Yes, you heard that right, a whopping two pounds. That's like emptying your pockets and thinking you've lost weight. It wasn't enough for the coveted gastric bypass surgery. What followed was an intense showdown with Dr. Now. Ashley, frustrated and defeated, going toe to toe with the doc. The tension was thicker than her favorite milkshake. How do you think weight loss surgery is gonna help you? It helped me in so many ways. It helped me to get more healthier. It helped me with, you know, losing the weight. It was just- it oh, Okay, with helping losing weight. How is it gonna help you lose weight? That's what the question is. How? The question is how? How is it gonna help you? You want me to give you the answer? Y'all ready to go, because get... I'm, I'm done. You like, I'm get... done. Okay, look at me. It's gonna help you by make you eat less. Now, if you thought the drama ended there, you're sorely mistaken. Ashley's frustration reached a boiling point, leading to a fiery confrontation. She stormed out in a scene that could rival any reality TV meltdown. It was like watching all her struggles explode in one dramatic moment. Her journey, full of setbacks and tiny victories, is a stark reminder that weight loss isn't just about diet and exercise. It's about wrestling with your inner demons and finding the strength to keep pushing forward. Smooth. You will get trampled. Um, Bitch, that bastard. No, I would take a couple deep breaths. No, I'm done. Like, at the end of the day, I've been coming there like, no, I'm up here wasting my money coming to this appointment. Let's start with a visual. Imagine not being able to stand for more than a mere 45 seconds. Yep, that's Kine, needing a pit crew just to hit the bathroom. Her nieces, Elisa and Deja, are like the unsung heroes of shower time and her nephew. He's the walking assistant all-star edition. It's like a bizarre relay race just for everyday survival. Ever heard of a more exhausting routine just for basic hygiene? I didn't think so. I'm ready to get washed up. Alicia is 16. If I'm gonna take a good shower, Alicia helps. Or if Deja's here, she helps. It is 19. And she's in college, so she's in and out of the house here. You can't be 600 proud. Now let's rewind a bit. At the tender age of 10, Kene was already a whopping 150 pounds. By 13, she was cruising past 230, 240 pounds. But here's the kicker. Despite the numbers climbing faster than a cat up a tree, she was living it up in high school. Dating, prom, the works, it's almost like her weight was just another minor inconvenience like a zit on prom night. Total denial mode, right? Just keeps on piling up those pounds without a second thought. I got bigger, and by the time I was 14, 
I believe I was around 2.30 or 2.40 then. But I don't feel like I missed out on anything during that time because of my size. So I was happy in high school. I dated. I went to prom. So I didn't see a reason to change how I ate. So I kept eating more and gaining weight. And I graduated from high school at 17. I was well over 350 pounds. Post high school, Kenne snagged a job and moved out. Independence, woohoo! But her love affair with fast food and binge eating tagged along. Next thing you know, she's hitting the 400 pound mark. But why worry? She's mobile, so all's peachy in her world. Denial, meet reality. Because things are about to get way more complicated. For the worst, and it was at that time, my weight had gotten up to around 400 pounds. But I didn't feel bad because I could still move around pretty good. I was still moving and working and, you know, walking around and not hurting. It just didn't really bother me. So I kept on doing whatever I wanted with food and eating. Kenne had dreams, big, fluffy, cotton candy dreams. She wanted to expand her family, but her weight? Major roadblock. It was wreaking havoc on her fertility and her health. Then life throws her a double whammy, losing her mom and a tornado leveling her house. Seriously, it's like Mother Nature and fate teamed up for a sucker punch. And of course, food becomes her solace, the ultimate comfort in a cruel world. It's only gotten stronger, but there were some struggles. Infertility can put a strain on the relationship. I just always figured that once I found someone that I wanted to settle down with, I'd get pregnant, we'd have kids, we'd go on with life. But I wasn't getting pregnant. I was diagnosed with PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome, and it did attribute to weight gain, and that devastated me. Fast forward to age 41. Kanae decides it's time to flip the script and calls in the cavalry. Dr. Now hits her with a strict 1-200 calorie diet and a goal to drop 75 pounds in two months. Easy peasy, right? Wrong. Especially when Kine's the queen bee of the kitchen. Can she handle this plot twist? No. Okay. No one's gonna step on my toes. Well, the dynamic seems to be that you get everyone to enable you and you use them as a crutch. And it sounds like that is affecting their health too. So would you agree with that? I can, I'll use them as a crutch because I do prepare food for my family and I do prepare large quantities of food for my family, but we could use, we could choose better options. Okay. I could choose better options because I'm the one that... First checkup time, she shed a mere 22 pounds, a far cry from that 75 pound goal. Doctor now isn't having it. When he confronts her, she snaps back with, you're not a magician and you're not a god. You're just a doctor. Yikes. Talk about biting the hand that feeds you. Offensive much? Everybody can buckle down and follow the diet for a few months. And if you don't do that, the reality is you don't want help. What you want is somebody to do the work for you. So if you expect us to be magically make you lose weight, it's not gonna happen. I never asked you for magic. You're not a magician and you are not God. You I'm the doctor who's telling you how to get healthy. Despite the rocky start, Kenny sticks to the 1-200 calorie plan. Doctor now ropes in psychotherapist Dr. Paradise, who suggests she write a letter to her late mom. A heartwarming, tear-jerking step, right? Well, it's more about processing grief than winning a Pulitzer. Will this emotional detour be her breakthrough? I was never able to get any closure from losing her because of my size. I couldn't go to her burial and say goodbye. And it's one of my biggest regrets that I let my weight get so out of hand that I couldn't do that. So I want to make that right. And I want to say all the things I never got to say to her. By her third appointment, Kini clocks in at 543 pounds. Surgery dreams hit a speed bump due to high white blood cell counts, her body's way of saying, not so fast. And here we are, left hanging. 
Will Kinney's dreams of a fresh start ever materialize, or is she stuck in this tragic loop? If Kinney's journey doesn't make you want to scream at your TV, I don't know what will. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you laughed, cried, or these stories made you feel gross, subscribe and hit the bell so you're always in the loop. Share this with your friends. Because who doesn't love a good transformation story? And I also want you to go to a hematologist to make sure that there's no other issues contributing to that outlet of white cancer. Okay. The other thing is that the, your record should show that you had some episode of, of um, um, rapid heartbeat and atrial fibrillation, and that is something that we need to be concerned because with that issue, my surgery. I'm miserable. My weight has trapped me in this bed, and it's killing me. You're killing yourself with the food. Which part of that is so hard to understand? The life that I'm living is pathetic, it's disgusting, and I'm going to die very soon. Hello, everyone. Before we start today's episode of The Moments Will Make You Gag on My 600 LB Life, hit that subscribe button and smash the bell so you never miss out on these stories. Ready? Let's get to it. Marla McCants' journey from Nashville to a whole new life is nothing short of a inspiring. When we first met Marla in season three, she was in a critical state, weighing around 800 pounds. Her weight had reached a point where regular hospital scales couldn't measure her, and she was living a life confined to her bed. I hate living like this. I have arthritis, gout, lymphedema, diabetes. I'll check my sugar level. 152, that's high. And I am on oxygen at night, or I'll stop breathing. Behind Marla's struggle with weight was a story of fear and trauma. After a harrowing experience with an abusive boyfriend who took her hostage and later attacked police officers, Marla lived in constant fear. This fear, knowing her ex was still at large and wanting to harm her, led her to stay home and turn to food for comfort, particularly junk food. It wasn't until my early 20s that my weight started to be a problem. Something drastic happened, and this is the outcome. I tried to break up with my boyfriend at the time. He lost it, and he took me hostage. He held me at gunpoint, and I thought I was going to die. Her weight gain spiraled from there, with Marla becoming completely dependent on her three daughters, especially her daughter Adele, who took care of her daily needs. I have three daughters, and I depend on them for everything. It makes me feel like a burden to them. I'm 24, and I have to take care of my mom. I wipe her, bathe her, make sure she's clean, and I do get tired. Deciding enough was enough, Marla, with the support of her family, embarked on a 13-hour journey to Houston to seek help from Dr. Now. Upon arrival, Marla was in dire straits, struggling to breathe and exhausted from the journey. Her situation became so critical that she stopped breathing one night and was rushed to the ICU. Later, she also underwent surgery to remove a blood clot in her leg. Yeah, the Sitaknas are then. Who is this? I'm calling you about the Marla's condition. Her condition worsened, and early this morning she stopped breathing and we moved her to ICU. Marla's health has continued to decline. We put her on a breathing machine. Doctor Now put Marla on a strict 1,000 calorie a day diet. Despite her initial reluctance and struggles, including skipping physical therapy and not sticking to her diet, Marla's story took a turn for the better. Hopefully she'll start to have a different perspective on things soon. I've been pushed for four or five months and I'm ready for a break. With her daughter Sierra moving in to help and motivate her, Marla began to see results. She was determined to change her life, not just for herself, but for her family. Her perseverance paid off, and Marla managed to lose an astonishing 266 pounds by the end of the show. My mom can't keep doing this. I know she's gonna die soon if that's the case. 
Hey, is this Dr. Now's office? Yes, I can I leave him a message? Hey, Dr. Now, this is Sierra Marla's daughter. Really hasn't been following the orders you gave her when she left the hospital. She's not making an effort to stand up, so I'm just really, really concerned about her. Can you please talk to her when you get a chance? Thank you. But Marla didn't stop there. She continued to work on her weight loss journey, ultimately losing nearly 600 pounds. Her transformation has been so remarkable that she now travels across America as a motivational speaker, sharing her story of overcoming grief and weight loss. She encourages others to believe in change and offers hope to those who may feel trapped in their circumstances. Good job. I'm so proud of myself. Makes me feel like I can do anything. About 300 pounds less, huh? Can you tell the difference? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Marla is going in the right direction and I am confident she'll be able to keep making progress. Wonderful. She did really good. You're in good shape. I realized that no one was going to do this for me. I had to do it myself. I Ever wondered what it's like when determination meets a roller coaster of emotions? Well, strap in, because today we're diving into the intense journey of Erica Wall. Erica's story begins in 2017, stepping onto the scale at a staggering 661 LLBS. At 44 years old, Erica turned to food as her solace through a challenging upbringing. Every time that I do wake up, I'm just as surprised as everyone else. And as soon as I get up, my body gets so starving and so hungry that I just have to eat. But some days I feel like a ticking time bomb. Imagine the struggle of feeling trapped, unable to walk anywhere without help, and struggling with your independence. The only consistent visitor she had was her niece, who, despite good intentions, sadly kept feeding Erica's addiction with a steady supply of junk food. It makes you wonder, doesn't it? How far can love and care go before they become harmful? I feel extremely isolated and cut off from the outside world. And the only family member I get to see on a consistent basis is my niece, Jessie. She is the only one that comes and helps me, takes care of me. Hey. Hey. Good to start your shower? Yes. Picking up from where we left off, Erica's not just dealing with physical weight, but the emotional baggage from a family that's drifting apart. The oldest of three siblings, her strained relationships with her brother and sister, who were frustrated by her initial lack of effort to improve her situation, add layers to her already complicated life. It's like watching a family drama unfold, isn't it? But wait until you hear what changed everything for them. I kept gaining into high school and I hit 300 pounds. And the bigger I got, the more my father shared his disappointment in me. But that didn't matter when I was eating. Food made me happy. But then something terrible happened to me when I was 16 and my life totally changed forever. Before we dive deeper, let's rewind to Erica's childhood for a moment. Growing up wasn't easy. She faced constant teasing from her father about her weight and suffered unimaginable trauma at the hands of people she should have been able to trust. Life dealt her a harsh hand early when, after a failed stomach stapling at just 17, she found herself battling weight gain again. The real kicker, the tragic loss of her mother in a car accident. The one person who had always stood by her side. It's heartbreaking, really, to lose your pillar of support when you need it the most. My first sexual experience was a gang rape. After the rape, I told my mom. She was angry. She was crying. It was too much for her to hear. I begged her not to tell my dad, and to this day, I don't think he knows. Now, 
back to the show where Dr. Now gave Erica a lifeline. Her first big challenge, dieting to qualify for gastric bypass surgery. Dr. Now, known for his no-nonsense approach, put her on a strict, low-carb, high-protein diet, capping her at 1,200 calories daily. Here's where things start to get a bit spicy. When a nutritionist checks in on her progress, what do they find? A fridge, still packed with all the high-carb, high-calorie enemies of her weight loss journey. Oh, Erica, what were you thinking? Got some Greek yogurts, 80 calories, high protein, great. The good thing about protein is it keeps your blood sugars at a high level and you may not get as hungry. When you eat carbs, a lot of times your insulin goes way up, brings your blood sugar down, and you're hungry again. All right, so I think to make it easy for you, let's get some of this food out of the house. Okay, no, you're not happy about it. This next part had viewers shouting at their screens. Instead of owning up to her diet detours, Erica lashes out during the junk food purge, throwing a fit about wasting food and boldly declaring her plan just to reorder everything tossed out. Can you believe that? Talk about audacity. Moments like these make you question whether the path to change is only as clear as one's willingness to walk it. Not having the foods in the house, will that make it easier? Yes. All right, so I'm putting this in the trash, and I know this is hard for you, but it's gonna be easier. Take care. Can't believe she just wasted all that food. I'm so frustrated right now but I can just order more. And there's nothing she can really do to stop me from doing that. So she completely wasted her time. This is just so much harder than I had ever imagined. Enjoying the episode so far? Give it a thumbs up and leave your thoughts in the comments below. Hang in there because Julius J.T. Clark's story is about to get even more interesting. Meet Julius J.T. Clark a remarkable young man from Claremore, Oklahoma, who took on an extraordinary at the age of 32. Tipping the scales at around 892 pounds, JT became one of the heaviest individuals ever to appear on the show. Every day of my life is pretty much the same. I wake up and eat. And I try to keep eating for as long as I can because it's what I live for now and it's all I want to do. And I can't start my day until I've had something. So when my girlfriend Jessica wakes up, she usually gets up before me and heads out, but she never leaves me without leaving something I like by the bed. When JT first appeared on the show in season eight, viewers were shocked to learn he weighed almost 900 pounds, burdened further by a 100 pound lymphedema mass. During a month-long hospital stay, JT showed promising progress by shedding 100 pounds. Because I sink in so deep, it's like trying to get out of cotton candy or pudding. But as hard as it is, getting up out of bed is the easy part. Because not only do I have all the weight of my body pulling down on me, I also have severe lymphedema on my left leg. I can't walk properly because my lymphedema pushes against both of my legs. However, this period of progress was shadowed by personal turmoil as his girlfriend broke up with him, plunging him into depression. Dr. Now, seeing his struggle, recommended rehab to help JT continue his journey in a supportive environment. I um, want to talk about things because he doesn't want to talk about them. It makes me feel like I have to bottle everything up. I love JT a lot, and that's what makes it hard. How do you feel about me leaving? Stressed. Uh, I mean, like, I told you, this ain't gonna be easy. This is gonna be literally torture. And I'm not, I'm definitely not gonna be easy to cope with during it. Rehab, however, presented its own set of challenges. Despite the controlled environment, JT found ways to cheat on his diet through takeout orders, leading to a disappointing 10 pound weight loss over two months. The doctor now says I need someone down here to help me. So my cousin Blair came down to visit me a couple of days ago. I was told by Dr. Now that I'm getting transferred to a rehabilitation center. Yeah. Uh -oh. 
doctor now confronted him about his diet, but JT was in denial, claiming he hadn't gained any weight. Dr. Now, experienced and straightforward, expected a much more significant weight loss given JT's size and condition. No matter you in Houston or Oklahoma or Timbuktu, mm -hmm. nothing justified to be unhealthy and give me all that rhetoric that I didn't follow that because I wasn't planning to be in here. Okay. Really, I mean, this is your life. This is your health. Okay. And you are responsible for it, and we've given you help and tools to change your life and be healthy, and you're making all kind of nonsense uh, reason not to follow the eyes, right? Feeling trapped and depressed in rehab, JT expressed a desire to return home and continue his weight loss journey independently. His cravings grew intense and seemingly uncontrollable, with Dr. Now warning that this path could lead to dire consequences. But then he wants to use that as an excuse to continue to self-destruct and kill himself with food. Or whether he wants to start to truly make the changes he needs to save his life. But we can't keep him here forever. So he's going to decide which path he wants to go down. I guess I'm still not getting out of here anytime soon. Despite his initial resistance, reminiscent of a defiant teenager, the relentless support from Dr. Now and his team eventually steered JT back on track. But right now, my focus is on doing what I have to to get out of here. Remarkably, JT's story transformed over the years. He underwent weight loss surgery, which was a turning point, allowing him to lose about 400 pounds. With his weight halved from his first appearance on the show, he weighed in at 491 pounds. At least my surgery went well and I'm making more progress. But Doc said he's coming by to see me and if I'm doing well enough, that he's gonna discharge me. So my hopes are up that I can get out of here today and go back to having a little more freedom again. Off the show, JT continued to thrive. He has been open about his battles with depression, sharing his experiences on social media to inspire others. Keeping a relatively low profile, he occasionally gives fans a peek into his life through Facebook updates. And a couple of weeks ago, I was able to go far enough to discover a nearby park. It's small, but it's nice. And without a car, it's at least a place I can go to feel like I'm enjoying the outdoors. It sounds crazy, but when you're almost 900 pounds, you forget which it's all you can feel. So I'm savoring being able to do something like this now. Tommy's life was far from simple. His weight brought along not just the usual health concerns, but piled on some pretty severe complications. He suffered from extreme lymphedema and could barely stand for more than 30 seconds. To breathe, Tommy depended on an oxygen tank for every breath. And if that wasn't enough, he lived in constant fear of falling over. Because if he did, he might not be able to get up again. To manage this fear, he wore grip socks, even in the shower, to prevent any slips. Can you imagine dealing with all that every day? I don't go out. I can't do much. And I get sad about it, because I remember a day when I'd just get up and go. But now, my home is my cage. And the way my body is, is what keeps me trapped here. But when I get up, it puts pain all through my whole body. And my feet hurt because they're getting stomped to the ground. My legs ache because of the lymphedemia, and my knees ain't because they're deteriorating. At home, Tommy wasn't alone in his journey. He lived with his fiance, Amanda, who was a pillar of strength for him. Amanda managed their home and cared for Tommy, handling everything from household chores to cooking and serving Tommy's meals. And let's talk about those meals because Tommy truly had a love affair with food. He didn't just eat three times a day, he ate eight meals daily. Once he started eating, it was hard for him to stop. But where did this all start? Food is what I live for. I'd eat every minute of the day if I could. In some ways, I'm already close to doing that because I eat like eight meals a day. And Amanda is the one that cooks and brings it to me to make sure I'm happy. And she always makes something good. Very, very good. But my favorite is when she makes me a bunch of bologna sandwiches. That bologna and cheese sandwich is, that's probably my Achilles heel. It's hard to stop because it's hard to be happy. 
Let's rewind to Tommy's childhood, which was anything but stable. From a young age, Tommy turned to food as his comfort. His home life was chaotic, shadowed by his father's alcohol addiction, which often led to loud and distressing fights between his parents. The situation took a darker turn when he was eight, as he lost his father, deepening his emotional dependency on eating. Food was his escape, a solace from the pain and confusion of losing a parent so young. My father was an alcoholic. He meant well. Well, him and my mom did fight quite a bit. And most of that was because he, he drank. And because of all that, things in our house were chaotic and we get loud and scary. So what I remember I do is get some food and go eat. Because I always helped my fear go away and I felt better. But the struggles didn't stop with his father's death. A few years later, when Tommy was 11, he faced another horrifying situation. While his mother was at work, a friend of his mother, who was supposed to look after him, began physically abusing him. Terrified and alone, Tommy didn't tell anyone about what he was going through. Instead, he found comfort where he always did, in food. No one should ever go through something like this. It was worse when I was 11, because with my mom having to work a lot, she had friends start to watch me when she couldn't be around. And he kind of started an inappropriate relationship with me. And he molested me. I didn't understand what was going on. I, I know I was in pain. I know I didn't like it. And I know I couldn't say anything or I... Fast forward through the years, and by the time Tommy graduated from high school, his weight had soared to over 500 pounds. But at the age of 38, Tommy hit a turning point. He was tired of the life he was leading and desperate for change. That's when he decided to reach out to Dr. Now, hoping for a life-saving solution. During his first appointment, Tommy weighed in at a staggering 641 pounds. Dr. Now put him on a strict 1,200 calorie diet complemented by minor exercises. But would Tommy be able to stick to this diet given his addiction with food? So first thing I want to do is, I'm gonna give you both a new diet to start immediately, okay? okay. It's a 1200 calorie a day, high protein, no carb diet. That will break down what you should and you shouldn't eat, okay? Okay. You need to make those changes to be permanent and stick with them. You think you can do that? Yes, sir. By the end of his episode, Tommy had managed to lose 189 pounds, feeling a lot better and more in control of his life. Dr. Now was pleased, but emphasized that it wasn't enough. He challenged Tommy to continue losing weight at a steady pace to qualify for skin removal surgery in the future. Tommy's commitment showed through his progress, highlighting his determination to turn his life around for good. Thanks for watching. If you found these stories as mind boggling as we did, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more jaw dropping stories. Don't forget to ring the bell so you never miss an update. Um, I'm doing pretty good. Okay. And um, how is the therapy working for you? Uh, Dr. Lola is doing pretty good. She does. It helped me a lot with my issues. All right, well, you lost 24 pounds over the last two months instead of 40. But the good news is 12 pounds a month is better than 8 pounds a month. So you're at least moving in the right direction with that. I'm just grotesque. I'm huge. I'm sickening looking. I live in this constant shame. How do I fix this? Delana Boyer's story began in Greenville, Tennessee, with a childhood marked by turmoil and instability. Raised by her cousin after being kidnapped by her biological mother, Delana's early life was a series of traumatic events. Food quickly became her comfort and escape, a lifelong love affair with carbs and calories that played out like a tragic romance novel. Hello everyone! Before we jump into today's wild ride of the most nastiest people on my 600 pound life, smash that subscribe button and hit the bell so you never miss out on these jaw-dropping stories. Ready? Let's get to it! She told me that we were gonna go get candy, me and my sister, and she 
took us in the car. She sent my sister out about a couple miles down the road and told her to walk home, and she kidnapped me. Delena's weight gain was as predictable as a reality TV script. Emotional eating became her coping mechanism in response to her chaotic upbringing. Her family life was a mess, and food was the only constant in her world. She consumed it all, from junk food to sugary drinks, like she was training for an Olympic eating contest. If emotional eating were an Olympic sport, Delena would have been a gold medalist. Brownies or cookies to solve the problems that are happening. It was a euphoria feeling. I would gain weight and then I would level out for a little while and then I would end up gaining more weight and level out for a little while. And when I finished high school, I was in roughly 18 size clothes and I stayed that size. Delena's eating habits were a spectacle. Imagine a daily diet consisting of fast food breakfasts, fried lunches, and dinners that could feed a small village. Throw in snacks that could stock a convenience store, and you get the picture. Her relationship with food was like a bad romance novel. Toxic, addictive, and utterly compelling to watch. Give up those sweets. Yes. I'm determined. Are you going to handle it if I'm skinnier? Yeah. You still going to love me if I'm skinnier? Yep. Make my life a whole lot easier. How? I don't want to do everything. True. Brain freeze. Why did Delena visit Doctor now? After years of failed diets and fleeting motivation, she decided to seek professional help. Enter Doctor Now Zaradin, the patron saint of tough love and no nonsense medical advice. Delana's journey to Houston, Texas to meet Dr. Now was nothing short of dramatic. Her car broke down only 50 miles into the journey, leaving her stranded on a busy highway. The camera crew had to intervene to help push Delana to safety since she couldn't exit the vehicle due to her limited mobility. Talk about an emergency situation. You're gonna have to slam the brake. Did it overheat or anything? Nope, it just stopped. Not the same problem, we just got fixed. We're but we are. Delana asked Dr. Now to help her lose weight to qualify for bariatric surgery. Starting at 646 pounds, Dr. Now advised her to follow a strict diet plan. One that didn't include the words fried or extra cheese. He emphasized the need for portion control and exercise, setting a goal for her to lose 50 pounds in two months. It was like telling a fish to live on land, but Dr. Now was determined to save her from herself. Gotcha. What do you mean? Um, and then you just left that out <laughs> conveniently. It was just nothing. So let's talk about what you eat all day then. I prefer yogurt. Um, the Greek yogurt, I love it. Okay, That's how much? Usually one of the little cups, because I started buying the cups because they're portioned, okay. right? Progress was a word that took a vacation when it came to Delana. By her second weigh-in, she had made some progress, reaching 578 pounds. If losing weight were a race, Delana was still tying her shoelaces at the starting line. Dr. Now was not happy and set further goals, requiring her to lose an additional 55 pounds to qualify for surgery. But the, the reality is that you're not following the diet, okay? If you eat this, you going to lose weight. So you want to take the chance and move that to Houston? That will be pointless, unless you start to make the choices you need to change your life. Right. You understand that? Yes, sir. So if you lose 55 pounds to cover the goal I gave you, plus five pounds, then we will move ahead with you. By her third visit, Delena managed to make more significant strides. Despite multiple setbacks, including a missed appointment due to her car breaking down, Delena persevered. She and her significant other and caretaker, James, relocated to Houston to be closer to Dr. Now, which made the process easier. This was a step in the right direction, and her resilience began to shine through. All right, so you think you can continue with this? Yes. Well, I'm proud of your progress. Thank you. And if you keep this up and lose another 40 pounds next month, you'll be ready for surgery. 
Okay. So I'm going to approve you for surgery, providing if you lose another 40 pounds. Okay. Okay. Did Delana get the surgery? Surprisingly, yes. After 10 months of dedication, Delana underwent bariatric surgery. The surgery was successful, but her weight loss journey was more of a slow crawl than a triumphant sprint. By the end of the episode, she had lost around 100 pounds, emerging with a promising trajectory to lose 20 pounds per month. It was progress, but considering where she started, it felt like a drop in a very large bucket. A year into her journey, she appeared to be thriving, sharing enjoyable moments with James and making good progress on her path to improved health. I'm overweight. They're going to do operation. It's my heart may not be able to take it. Who knows? Mistletoe here, mistletoe there for a hug and kiss before surgery. <laughs> I love you. Love you this is the next chapter of my life. This surgery is definitely the next chapter. Every day is a new beginning, but. Imagine hitting 30 and realizing you weigh 668 pounds. That's where Ashley Reyes found herself, parked on the couch in West Hills, California. Describing herself as a monster wasn't just melodrama, it was her harsh reality. The emotional weight was just as crushing as the physical, with Ashley feeling like a burden to her husband, Daniel, and her mom. Can you even imagine that level of self-loathing? It's heavy stuff. My entire body is in constant pain. I'm completely miserable. It's a struggle to just move at this weight. Do you need me to help you up? I can't do anything on my own. So my husband and I have to live with my parents and my sisters. Ashley's day started with three plates piled high with junk food that greeted her every morning. Veggies, eggs, put. Who needs those when you can have a mountain of grease and carbs? Her eating habits were like a horror movie for nutritionists. And let's not even start on her hygiene. Ashley's hygiene, or lack thereof, was a horror show. Bathing twice a month? Seriously, who does that? But it's a testament to how deep in the pit of despair she was. Even the simple act of bathing becomes a Herculean task when you're that big. In order to not have the rough patches on my skin, uh, my mom has to scrub me really, really hard with an abrasive sponge. Okay. So what led Ashley down this path of caloric carnage? Childhood trauma, of course. She turned to food as her emotional crutch after being abused by her uncle. This isn't just sad, it's the kind of emotional baggage that translates into physical ruin. Her marriage? Struggling, just like her waistline. It's gut-wrenching to see how deep emotional scars can manifest in such destructive ways. Because when I was 12 years old, my uncle sexually assaulted me. And I didn't know what to do, I didn't know how to feel safe. So. I would eat to gain back whatever little happiness I could. Food filled the void that I was feeling on the inside. And at first, I didn't say anything. Enter Dieter now, the no-nonsense surgeon who doesn't sugarcoat, because let's face it, Ashley's had enough sugar for a lifetime. Their first meeting was a masterclass in excuse-making from Ashley, with Dr. Now slicing through her justifications as he slices through bariatric surgery. His prescription? A 1-200 calorie diet. For Ashley, this was probably more shocking than seeing a ghost. When you're used to inhaling calories by the thousand, this advice must have felt like starvation. So why are you doing that? Because I'm hungry. I know I shouldn't eat like I do. But in everything I eat, I feel so guilty about eating it. You know, I, I know that I'm not supposed to be eating, you know, sweets or sugary things, but I crave them. And at this point, I know that I need weight loss surgery. You already forget the solution, but uh, you need to figure out the problem. Ashley's journey was a seesaw of success and failure. First weigh-in after a couple of months, she'd lost 54 pounds. 
Not bad, but in Dr. Now's book, that's just scratching the surface. He urged her to dig deeper and push harder, reminding her that this was life or death. Second visit, another 30 pounds down, better, but still a far cry from the miracle she needed. It's like watching someone try to plug a sinking ship with chewing gum. I think I weigh everything in ounces, make sure the portions are under control. I have more protein, and now I don't snack at all. Okay, super. Ashley's done well this month. Losing 54 pounds has demonstrated that she's able to control her eating habit. She's shown me that she's willing to work hard for this and not just trusting in the magic pill. You're doing good and you lost uh, some weight, so I'm gonna put you for weight loss surgery. Dr. Now finally gave her the green light for surgery, and her relief was palpable. It was like she'd been handed a golden ticket out of her personal hell. Post-surgery, her transformation was nothing short of miraculous. She continued to shed weight, hitting a total loss of 254 pounds by the episode's end. A victory, but the battle was far from over. Maintaining that weight loss would be a marathon, not a sprint. Oh, yeah. Good job. You're <laughs> there. I knew you could do it. <laughs> I can't even remember the last time I climbed that many stairs. It's been too long. I don't think I would have ever done this had it not been for just the push saying, why don't you try? Go forward. Boom, well, right? Now, give me a scout. A mean face. <laughs> I can't. Right? Liking the drama so far? Smash that thumbs up and drop your thoughts in the comments below. Stick around because Dottie Perkins' journey is about to get even more interesting and nastier. Dottie Perkins' journey on the show is one wild roller coaster of chaos, disappointment, and those mind boggling moments where you just sit back and think, seriously? Imagine a young girl grappling with food addiction since the tender age of three. Yeah, you heard that right. By the time she was seven, she was pushing 150 pounds. By her teenage years, her weight was nearly doubled. And as if that wasn't enough, she had the added stress of caring for her severely ill son. Heartbreaking is putting it mildly. I just clean as much as I can. And I will uh, allow anybody to help me wipe myself or clean myself. That's just way too embarrassing to me. The idea of my husband wiping my ass literally makes me sick. Dottie's childhood was a battlefield of trauma. Constant bullying, deep loss, and abandonment shaped her early years. She courageously shared the darker episodes of her life, including being abandoned by her father and surviving a horrifying encounter with a neighbor. The death of her grandmother was the icing on a very bitter cake, compounding her grief and piling trauma upon trauma. I mean, can you imagine dealing with all that and not losing your sanity? At one point, I was putting on a couple of pounds every week. And by the time I was 18, I was well over 300 pounds. And I remember just eating and eating and eating so much. And I've just never been able to stop. Dottie turned to DR, now seeking a lifeline out of her predicament in a desperate bid for change. But here's where things went south. There were promises, but follow through, not so much. Her commitment to Dr. Now's diet plan was more of a fleeting dream than a concrete action. The gap between what she intended to do and what she actually did was glaringly obvious. It was like watching a train wreck in slow motion. You just couldn't look away. Pizza. Pizza. Um, pizza. Okay. Um, sometimes Chris will pick up burgers. Basically, you live on fast food and all that. Yes. Dottie's answer to why she gained weight is to tell me about her kids. They are her excuse to eat. Her situation at home is tough. When it came time for her final weight I in, the moment of truth was brutal. Despite her claims of progress, Dottie had shed only a few pounds, missing the mark for qualifying for gastric bypass surgery. The non-seriousness left everyone wondering if Dottie's weight loss journey would continue or come to a screeching halt. 
And honestly, at this point, who could blame anyone for being skeptical? I was stressed out during that time, and I've made some poor choices eating. And I'm ready to put my health forward this time. And for me, uh, I've been... No, 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 no. You say you're ready, but you're not. You're still blaming stress and taking care of your kids as an excuse to eat. How is that going to change long term with the surgery? Eventually, Dottie managed to drop her weight below 300 pounds, a milestone she hadn't seen since she was 18. This achievement was monumental, considering the Herculean effort it took to get there. The journey was anything but easy, especially after the heartbreaking loss of her 13-year-old son, who had been battling cerebral palsy and scoliosis. With the support of Dr. Nozaradan and her dedicated trainer, Christina, Dottie fought through the pain and grief to reach her goal. If I'm not approved, I'd be very disappointed. Okay, you lost almost 70 pounds this month. So we're gonna set you up for weight loss surgery, okay? Yay! Okay, Yay. here's the deal though. The big test come in if you go home and start gaining weight, we're not uh, gonna put you on surgery schedule, it's okay? Not, it's not. Okay. It's not going So, Dottie has done very well. All right, okay, <laughs> all right. Imagine living your life confined to a bed that doubles as your dining area and bathroom. Yep, that was Penny's world. Her poor son, Liam, around five or six, had to come to her bedside every morning to say goodbye. Seriously, this kid deserves an award for the most patient child ever. I cannot do the things that normal people take for granted, like walking to the bathroom. This is my bed, this is my bathroom, this is my dinner table. I don't feel good. I might as well be a prisoner in jail. Mmm, it's gonna be good. Food addiction has become my life. Let's rewind a bit. Penny and her husband met when she was a mere 450 pounds. Back then, they were a relatively happy couple enjoying life together. But then, life happened. Marriage and pregnancy were the catalysts for a downward spiral that turned their lives upside down. Penny's weight shot up and their relationship took a nosedive. Her husband morphed from a partner into a full-time caregiver, relying on her disability income to make ends meet. Talk about a tough situation. After she had gotten pregnant, her weight went up to, I believe it was 630. After she had Liam, she had a hard time taking the weight off. It has affected a relationship extremely. It's been many years now since we've actually slept in the same bed. Right there is right. Now, here's where it gets even more cringeworthy. Penny's diet was a disaster. Imagine a shopping list that reads like a kid's birthday party chips, soda, candies, and ice cream. And her husband, Edgar, he played the perfect enabler, dutifully fetching all this junk food. This is where you wanna scream, dude, set some boundaries. But hey, enabling is easier than confronting the harsh truth, right? Chips, soda, cake mix, candy, it's usually junk. The list is done, but I know she likes ice cream. Ed loves Penny, but Penny is very stubborn, and Ed does enable her. He buys whatever she tells him, and if he doesn't, he's going to be in trouble. Ed definitely does bring the food in to the house. Determined to make a change, Penny decided to lose weight and go for weight loss surgery. That is a good plan in theory, but in reality, her trip to Houston to meet Dr. Now was like a fast food binge fest. By the time she rolled into Dr. Now's office, she weighed over 530 pounds. Dr. Now, ever the blunt truth teller, pointed out that while she had genuine health issues, some were, let's say, creatively exaggerated. You can almost hear him thinking, is this woman for real? Penny is very large, but to know her situation, I need to examine her and see how much she weighs. We're gonna check your weight now, okay? This is the largest fish in the market. 
Okay. A normal body mass index is about 20. 35 is morbidly obese. Over 40 is super morbidly obese. Dr. Now admitted Penny to the hospital and put her on a strict diet with the goal of losing 50 pounds a month. The first month in, and she managed to shed one pound, one single pound. It's almost impressive in a tragic way. Penny became the nightmare patient, refusing to do even minor exercises or sit up in bed. Dr. Now must have been thinking, is this my life now, dealing with the human embodiment of stubbornness? We're gonna keep uh, Penny under observation in a strict diet. If she loses weight in one month, uh, surgery would be an option. A little sticky now. Being in hospital, she should easily be able to lose 25 to 50 pounds. Nothing else has been successful, so getting this surgery now, it's... After four months of this nonsense and no significant progress, Dr. Now had enough. He sent her home, probably hoping he'd never see her again. Penny's follow-up was a disaster of missed appointments and zero weight loss. A year into her so-called weight loss journey, she hadn't lost any additional weight. After a particularly emotional outburst, Penny quit the program and went home. It's like she missed the memo that the weight loss journey requires actual effort. Penny's story is a stark reminder of how crucial personal commitment is. Without a genuine desire to change, you're just wasting everyone's time. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you laughed, cried, or these stories made you feel gross, subscribe and hit the bell so you're always in the loop. Share this with your friends, because who doesn't love a good transformation story? So stupid. I gotta find out why my diet is this diet. No one told me I had to lose weight when I got here. I'm very concerned about Penny's behavior. She's not losing weight anymore. She's been given the right diet. There is no reason why she shouldn't lose more weight while she's in the hospital. Oh! I've never been to jail, but I feel like that's what I'm in, and it's horrible. Food has just a grasp on me. I think I lean on food more than I did substances because when I eat food, I don't think about the substances. I've been working hard to lose weight, but I know I can do better. Shakia Jackson, a 26-year-old from North Carolina, was one of the youngest patients to seek help from Dr. Now. Weighing in at a staggering 655 pounds, she was already suffering from asthma and lymphedema, making every step a Herculean task. Imagine needing a walker in your 20s. It's like life's playing a cruel joke, but the punchline is that it hurts like hell. Hello, everyone. Before we dive into the most unsettling times on my 600-pound life, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so you never miss out on these jaw-dropping stories. Ready for the wild ride? Let's get into it. I wake up in the morning with swelling because of the lymphedema that's in my leg. When I first did, I'd be like, whoosh because of the pain in my leg, in my knees. So much pain because it's so much weight. The best I get to the bathroom is like my breathing is like bad. I already have asthma too, so. Her eating habits were nothing short of a horror show. Picture this, breakfast consisted of stacks of pancakes drenched in syrup, bacon, and eggs. A feast fit for a king, except it was just for her. And lunch? Fast food galore? Dinner? Well, let's just say it was a buffet of fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and desserts that could make a sweet tooth weep. Her family tried to intervene, but their attempts were as effective as a screen door on a submarine. They loved her, sure, but enabling seemed easier than confronting the issue. My family did try to tell me, cut down on food, choose better, healthy options. But I don't choose those options because the role of food in my life is a top priority. I've been like that ever since growing up. My mom was a single mom. Her past was riddled with trauma, including suffering from sexual assault and living in foster care. 
food became her solace, her shield against the world's cruelties. It's almost like she was building her own protective fortress with every bite. But instead of bricks and mortar, her fortress was constructed from burgers, fries, and sugary treats. Oh, the irony of seeking protection from something that's slowly killing you, right? My mom raised me until I was in the second grade. Then we were placed into foster care. When we was in second grade, my mom started leaving us on our own while she was working three jobs. So then one of the neighbors made a report to child services. And we were too young to know what was going on. When they took me away from my mom, I was in foster care for two to three weeks until my dad took full custody. Fortunately, Shakia began to have a good support system as she decided to take a drastic step by visiting Dr. Now. Their first meeting was, to put it mildly, a showdown. Dr. Now, with his no-nonsense attitude, didn't sugarcoat anything because, let's face it, Shakia had enough sugar in her diet already. He laid it all out, her current weight, the health risks, and the brutal truth that if she didn't change, she wouldn't live to see another decade. His advice? A strict 1-200 calorie diet and a regimen of moderate exercise. Easier said than done for someone who considered lifting a fork as cardio. What is the highest weight you have been? This is the highest weight. So what do you think got you to this point? Um, I became an emotional eater. What do you mean you've been an emotional eater? I had some dramatic things happen. So at what age did you notice that you were overweight? I really started noticing like my weight really picking up when I was like in college. But it wasn't until recently it got worse to where I'm not able to do like the things I used to do. Shakia's progress was a roller coaster of emotions. Initially, she was tasked with losing 50 pounds to qualify for bariatric surgery. However, her first weigh-in after starting the program was a crushing disappointment. She had lost only a few pounds. The disappointment was palpable, and the excuses flowed like the soda she used to drink. But Dr. Now, ever the tough taskmaster, wasn't having any of it. He demanded accountability and, quite frankly, showed her the mirror she had been avoiding. If not, you're not going to be able to live long because your view probably has helped to survive with a BMI like that. You're only 26. If you keep this up, you may not make it to 30. And at this point, we give you the roadmap and start working on this. Okay. So how much weight does she need to lose? Around 500 pounds for her height. But if you're talking about her first goal, she needs to lose 50 pounds over the next two months. However, Shakia's journey took a harrowing turn when she suffered from respiratory failure. She recalled going to bed one night and waking up on a ventilator. The ordeal left her using a walker, adding another layer of difficulty to her already challenging path. Despite this, she only managed to drop 20 pounds over a year. Her failure to lose the required weight led Dr. Now to drop her from the program. He told her that he might consider taking her as a patient again if she got herself back on track. I'm at 635. Uh, 635, so you lost eight pounds instead of 50. And that's not a lot of progress. That's as much as I lost in the past year. That's an improvement. So that's not saying much. The reality is that it's been over a year now and you only lost 20 pounds. So you haven't changed your diet much at all. I cut back and I cut back even more on these past few months. So I'm trying, doctor, now. If you give me another chance, I could keep going and lose even more. James's life was a mess from the start. Tipping the scales at an astronomical 8 on 40 pounds, James was about as mobile as a couch. Seriously, he couldn't bathe or even go to the bathroom without help. Talk about living the dream, right? His girlfriend Lisa and his daughter Bailey were his lifelines, managing his care around the clock. Friends had to step in for tasks that were too much for Lisa alone, like bathing him. Now, that's friendship taken to a new, disturbing level. James cannot take care of himself at all. He cannot bathe himself. He cannot use the restroom. He has to wear a catheter. And it breaks my heart to see that James is trapped in a bed and can't do the things that he loves to do. Okay. Don't let me get hard. I'm not. I got you. Uh, well, that's good. 
into a chaotic household, his parents split due to his mother's alcohol issues, leaving him in the care of his dad. When his father remarried, James found himself one of five children in a financially strained household. This financial pressure led to poverty, and the fear of not having enough food made James eat as much as he could whenever it was available. I mean, you can't blame a kid for wanting to avoid starvation, but James took it to a whole new level. But my dad didn't make enough to provide for a family that big. And we went from having what we needed to being really poor. And I never knew if we were gonna have enough to eat. So I just started to eat as much as I could when I got the chance. And I remember the joy and safety there was in food. So I started gaining some, and I was around 250 when I started high school. James's manipulation tactics made his situation even more complex. He was a master manipulator, often using guilt and emotional appeals to get what he wanted, even at the expense of his health and his loved one's well-being. Imagine having your daughter drop out of school to support you, only to see that sacrifice exploited. Dark right? This guy had a knack for making everyone around him feel like they owed him something. I always feel guilty because we just keep giving it to him. It looks good, baby. When I tell him he doesn't need it, he'll get mad and he'll yell. It makes me angry and sad at the same time. I'm so frustrated. Put the, that gravy on my plate with a new biscuit. One for now or? No, two. Two. Well, gravy all over the top. Enter Dr. Now, the bariatric surgeon known for his tough love approach. Their first meeting was nothing short of dramatic. Dr. Now took one look at James and knew he was a ticking time bomb. He warned James that his body was on the verge of giving out. James seemed to think he was signing up for some miracle cure, not realizing he was in for a rude awakening. Dr. Now's advice was blunt. Lose weight through diet and exercise before he could be considered for surgery. Imagine being told to drop a few hundred pounds as if it's just a matter of skipping dessert. Hello. Uh, How y'all doing? Uh, James, I'm back in a second. Uh, I want you to calm down right now because we're taking care of you, okay? Uh, and how are you doing? Terrible pain. I can't hardly move. I'm hurting so bad. Okay. Uh, let's move to that bed over there. Uh, relax, relax, relax. Uh, oh. Ow. Hold the stretcher still. Really. On three. One, two, three. You don't let his leg fall. James, how do you feel now? Hurting. Okay, let me take a look at you. James's progress, or ELAC thereof, was a spectacle. On his second visit, it was clear he hadn't made the necessary changes. Excuses flowed like soda from a fountain, and the manipulative behavior continued. Dr. Now, with his no-nonsense approach, reiterated the importance of sticking to the diet plan and exercising. Yet, James's stubbornness was a formidable opponent. By the third visit, there was still minimal progress. You could almost hear Dr. Now thinking, what part of diet and exercise don't you understand? But just looking at him, you can tell that he's in pretty bad state. His cellulite is, is out of control, and he doesn't look to have lost any weight in the past four months. So how is your eating habit coming since I talked to you last time? Much better. James needs to take responsibility for his behavior. All right, we get you situated. We're going to get some blood tests on you, OK? OK. All right. During his hospital stay under Dr. Now's watchful eye, the plot thickened. James's mother, Lisa, was caught sneaking food into the hospital. Yes, you heard that right, like a twisted version of a heist movie, except instead of stealing jewels, she was smuggling snacks. Dr. Now's frustration hit an all-time high. He denied James the weight loss surgery, citing his refusal to adhere to the necessary lifestyle changes as the primary reason. Talk about tough love. You are the one that you got him in this bed, and you're the one making his life miserable right now. I've been trying to get him out of that bed. No, you are long. not. But if you did, last time I talked to you, you changed his diet. It doesn't look like he lost any weight. 
is this the lifestyle of a human being? This is a miserable lifestyle. No. And, and you got him into this shape, and you blaming everybody and him. I'm not blaming everybody. I'm not blaming him. Look, and, and if you all don't change the diet right now, he's going to go back to Kentucky. I'm not going to take care of him. I have brought him the food, but I didn't get him in that shape. James's story took an even darker turn when, despite all the interventions and efforts, he continued to struggle with binge eating. His refusal to alter his lifestyle led to a tragic end. On April 3, 2020, James passed away, leaving behind a cautionary tale of the devastating effects of obesity and the importance of taking personal responsibility for one's health. His story is a stark reminder of the severe consequences of failing to change harmful behaviors. James has had every chance and opportunity to lose the weight he needs to, and he has not wanted even to try. Until he starts with the excuses and lies, no other stage of the program will help him. Therapy won't, and he wouldn't survive an emergency weight loss surgery like sleep gastrectomy. So there's absolutely nothing I can do to help him. But hopefully, he'll work to get under 600 pounds. If he does, I'll continue him on this program. Enjoying the episode so far? Give it a thumbs up and leave your thoughts in the comments below. Hang in there because Dolly Martinez's journey is about to get even more unsettling. At 25, Dolly realized she had to make a drastic change. With health hanging by a thread, hello, congestive heart failure and oxygen tanks, she reached out to Dr. Now, the bariatric surgeon who takes no prisoners. Just imagine needing assistance to breathe. Dolly's life was in serious jeopardy from the start. Shy, shy. I live with my mother, but my best friend, Cheyenne, helps me when she's here sometimes. Good morning. Morning. Oh, that like? Cheyenne is a big girl like me too, so she understands where I'm coming from. I met Dolly over the internet. We grew up not too far from each other. Dolly's daily life, a blur of TV marathons, constant snacking and napping, eight hours in front of the screen, grazing like a cow in a field, and the occasional siesta. What a life, right? Her diet was a sugar orgy. Picture her at the grocery store, her cart gravitating to the candy aisle, piling up sweets like there's no tomorrow, brownies, ice cream, you name it. Dolly compared sugar to cocaine and heroin. Wow, talk about a sweet addiction. My mom would find the wrappers and get mad at me, but there's nothing she could do, really. The kindergarten. I was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, and bipolar disorder. I know that I am a little special ed because I have mental issues, but teachers made me feel like I was more special ed than I am. Here's the kicker. Her husband liked her bigger. Yep, you heard that right. He married her because of her size. As Dolly began shedding pounds, he morphed into the least supportive husband ever, practically sabotaging her efforts. A spouse who prefers you unhealthy? That's love. Twisted style. I had just turned 21 and I was 400 pounds. But I didn't have much income and I didn't have no place to live. And that's when I met Ricky, the man that I married, on a social media chat thread. It turned out we had something in common, because Ricky didn't have anywhere to go either. Ricky lived close to me, so we met in person, and not long after that, he invited me to come stay with him. Things took an even darker turn when their daughter was born, just six days old, and she was whisked away by Child Protective Services because Dolly and her husband couldn't provide a safe home. Her mother, Stacy, had to step in and take care of her. Can you believe the drama? It's like a soap opera on steroids. She's the most precious thing in ever. <laughs> she's a beautiful child, beautiful spirit. She's just full of life full of energy. I certainly didn't know three years ago I was going to be a mama, basically, again. I was given this child by CPS when she was six days old. A year later, we went to court, 
and she and her husband at the time both proved to the judge. At her first weigh-in with Dr. Now, Dolly tipped the scales at 593 pounds. Trying to patch things up with her mom, she ended up back with her unhelpful husband. Things spiraled out of control, landing her in a homeless shelter. There, she met Philip, and within six weeks, they were engaged, still homeless. Speedy engagement. Much? And you do it the same way backwards. Once you did 20, you did the other one. <laughs> oh, 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 come on. All right. You don't have to do, exceed yourself every single time. Just work up to what you can do. All right. Yeah. I think I might go sit on the couch for them. OK. Dolly's progress was slower than a snail on a treadmill. By her second visit, the numbers barely moved. Dr. Now's patience was wore thin and understandably so. Her chaotic life was a wrecking ball to her progress. At her third visit, the situation hadn't improved, leaving Dr. Now with no choice but to hit pause on surgery plans. Come on. Oh, come on. Well, me and Philip finally found a house to move into. It took a lot longer to find an option we could afford than I thought it would. But we finally found one, which means I can go back and see Dr. Now. With her chaotic life and minimal weight loss, Dr. Now couldn't approve her for the life-changing surgery. By the episode's end, Dolly had only lost 40 pounds in a year. That's like running a marathon only to reach the first mile marker. Dolly's updates show her continuing to fight, proving that hope is a stubborn thing. What happened that she left home? I was told that I'm too controlling. I've encouraged her since she moved in with me to not overeat and to not eat what she shouldn't and to focus on herself, emotionally, physically, all aspects of herself. And she promised that she would do so. That's what I should have done. And she did not. Ryan Barkdahl's journey on the show is a stark reminder that sometimes, despite the best intentions, reality takes a detour down Disaster Avenue. The man started his journey tipping the scales at a jaw-dropping 740 pounds. Yep, you heard that right. This wasn't a quick trip to the recliner. Ryan had practically taken up permanent residence in his. Every single task was a Herculean effort. I could keep eating and eating and eating. By the time that I finish the meal that I'm eating, I'm already thinking about the next meal. Like when I'm eating breakfast, I ask my mom what we're having for lunch. But I need to know what's in line and what's next because I already can't wait to eat again, even though I just did. So my whole day basically revolves around me eating and drinking and how I'm going to get more of it. And that's what drives me. And that's what consumes my thought. His upbringing wasn't exactly a nurturing Norman Rockwell painting, more like a chaotic circus without a ringmaster. Mom and stepdad were hardly vying for Parent of the Year awards, which left Ryan to fend for himself. The result? A deep, enduring love affair with food. By the ripe old age of 17, Ryan was clocking in at over 300 pounds and juggling a hefty drug addiction. Seriously, talk about carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. Freshman and sophomore year, I partied pretty hard. I smoked a lot. I drank more than any parent knows I did. I was still eating all the time also, and I just got worse and spiraled more out of control. By the time I was 17, I was already up to 300 pounds. But that was a bad year for me because that was my junior year and I got caught with a gram of marijuana. Fast forward and hope came knocking in the form of DR Now. Ryan was ready, or so he said, to overhaul his life. But you know what they say about best laid plans, right? Despite Dr. Now's tireless efforts to whip him into shape, Ryan's commitment was about as solid as a sandcastle at high tide. A few months in and the needle on the scale barely budged. 
Hovering over 700 pounds, Ryan's adherence to the diet was more mythe than reality. But now, after five years, you have no friends, and it snows a lot, and you're weak because of that. I wouldn't say it like that. However you say it, that's what you're telling me. So it's concerning if you think those are actual excuses. My life's a lot harder than you'd understand. I heard that a lot of times, but that's not the issue. The issue is whether you're going to keep making excuses and blaming everything else for your situation. But wait, it gets better. Dr. Now, ever the optimist, set a new goal. Get below 650 pounds. Predictably, Ryan's weight stubbornly refused to cooperate, thanks in no small part to his penchant for cheat days. And when confronted, his excuse. The scale's malfunctioning. Oh, come on. That's right up there with the dog ate my homework. I'm not sure. The scale's malfunctioning. It won't give me a weight. Is it malfunctioning or are you still over the weight limit of the scale? I know I made it to your goal, Doctor, now. I worked hard, so I'm at least under 650 pounds right now. So you believe you're under 650 pounds? That's correct. All right. We will agree to disagree then because you don't look like you lost much weight since our last call. In the end, even Dr. Now's saint-like patience wore thin. With a heavy heart but firm resolve, Ryan was booted from the program. His story is a masterclass in what happens when ignorance meets indulgence. Ryan's journey, littered with missed opportunities and empty promises, is a stark illustration of how tough it is to align our actions with our intentions. Thanks for watching. If you found these stories as mind-boggling as we did, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more jaw-dropping stories. Don't forget to ring the bell so you never miss an update. I need to go back to how I was doing the diet before my mom intervened where I had my cheat days because that got me through the first month of doing this and not being able to have that made the last couple months way too hard. So I'm letting myself go back to my way and enjoy one day a week of whatever I want. I just want to enjoy something that tastes good and makes me feel good and that'll get me through the rest of the week to keep doing the diet and stay on track like I need to get to my next goal.